This Week in Startups is brought to you by Fiverr. Find the perfect freelance services for your business. Go to Fiverr.com and use code TWIST to receive 10% off your first order. That's F-I-V-E-R-R.com and use promo code TWIST. Zendesk, a service-first CRM company with support, sales, and customer engagement products designed to improve customer relationships. Qualifying startups can join the Zendesk for Startups program and get six free months of Zendesk products. Visit Zendesk.com slash twist today to get started. And Silicon Valley Bank. For over 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has been providing banking and financial solutions for every stage of the startup journey. Learn more at svb.com slash twist. Silicon Valley Bank. Ideas bank here. All right, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. We're here. Uh, today happens to be March 24th. Not sure when you're going to be listening to this, but we are in the middle of the coronavirus and wishing everybody well and everybody safe and practicing social distancing, which we are doing here. I'm in the studio and our guest is in the studio, but we are six feet apart. Yep. Uh, and so we're practicing social distancing and we're the only people in the studio except for the engineer. And we've been cleaning things like crazy on the program today uh, after many mentions from his investors on this podcast. Uh, Dylan Field is here. He is the CEO and co-founder of Figma. That's F-I-G-M-A dot com, which is a piece of software that allows you to design apps, websites, et cetera. And I think your original concept here, correct me if I'm wrong, was what if Photoshop existed in a browser window? Yeah, that was one prompt that kind of got us to Figma. Uh, but I think even further back from that, we're just kind of asking ourselves, like, what if all creative tools were online, collaborative, multiplayer, in the browser? Mm. Yeah, in the browser. Yep. At the time you started in 2012? Yeah, you got it was an insane concept. We, we didn't think it was Because browsers were but... for images, videos, and just whatever, but yeah. not for software, essentially. Yeah, I mean, you had Google Docs, you had Google Sheets. Uh, but that was kind of it. And um, yeah. we knew, because we had done, especially my co-founder had done some early work on WebGL, uh, which is the ability to use the GPU in your computer in mm. the browser. Uh, we knew it was possible. Uh, because of WebGL. Because of WebGL. So you could basically start to use the GPU to accelerate things and make uh, you know creative tools faster in the browser. And WebGL was created by who and for what purpose? Yeah, so WebGL came out of Mozilla, mm. um, and it was just basically a way to have an interface to the GPU inside the browser. And, then the and why is that adopted. important? Why is it important to WebGL? Yeah. yeah, why is it important to have WebGL? What was their impetus for doing that? Because we had Flash mm -hmm. before that. Yep. You had other tools for doing graphics in the browser. I'm not sure if they actually tapped into it. But was there some specific thing that led Mozilla to want to do this? Yeah, so I think there's a few different things that might be like worth going into there. One is, um, you know, why open standards are important. Mm. Uh, and the second one is why the GPU is important. Um, and so I think we'll start with the GPU. So yeah. if you look at sort of, uh, you know, Flash was CPU bound. Um, I don't believe there was a way to do anything with the no. GPU in Flash. Uh, you had actually, I don't know if you remember Aviary or yeah. companies like that. Um, you know, I think that they're kind of in this awkward middle space of, trying to create a creative tool and design it like it's for professionals, but the technology hadn't caught up enough for mm. them to actually be able to do it in a way that professionals needed. Mm. Uh, it wasn't performant enough, it was too slow, uh, it couldn't handle the complexity of the file formats people needed. And so uh, without the ability to interface the GPU, you couldn't use creative tools in this way uh, online. You couldn't run video games in your browser online. Right. Uh, and so, that's, I think, uh, just a really key unlock. Right. Uh, the other thing, though, I think is for under open standards, right? So, like, you might say, okay, well, why not have, like, a plugin for a browser right. that makes it so you can access the GPU? And I think just fundamentally, one thing that I really appreciate about Mozilla and the way they push the web forward, uh, which is now something I think that most companies represent, is, like, there's a desire to actually have open standards that make it so that uh, we can all sort of share the spec implementation uh, for how this works. And now we have WebGL and not just Mozilla, Firefox, but also Chrome and Safari and Brave, whatever. And in those browser wars, mm -hmm. Mozilla came out of Netscape. They open sourced it. AOL had bought it, for those people who don't know the history. And then Google had a secret project, uh, Chrome, mm -hmm. uh, which they did in stealth for a couple of years, launched it on the world. And now they are the 
number one browser in the world yep. by far. That's I, that's my, my, my <clears throat> belief. Um, I don't know the most recent stats, but yeah, Chrome yeah. is doing quite well. But Firefox is uh, continues to do well as well. Uh, they're, now, um, there are two different standards though, right? You have Mozilla standard and then you have Chromium. Is that the open source project that Chrome is based on? Yeah, there's Chromium. Um, but WebGL is an interface that you can actually use across all of them. Um, mm. And so we write Figma once. Right. Um, we actually write it in C++ oh. and compile through MScript into WebAssembly, which is another standard. Yep. Um, and making it so that you're able to basically have uh, the ability to run bytecode in the browser. And... Uh, with that, we're able to make it super efficient and then use WebGL to render everything. Got it. Uh, and we would write that once, and then it kind of like runs everywhere, which is sort of the original premise of like something like Java. But right. now you're able to do it in the browser with everything being sandboxed. And so if you're on a Chromebook, if you're uh, you have everything, I'm Chromebook segmented. crazy. Yeah, I love Chromebook. I have the new one, the mm -hmm. Pixel Book. Yep. Go or Pro? Well, no, it's Go. I think. Anyway, the new one is amazing. Yeah. Especially if you get 16 gigs of RAM. And then I have all Chrome boxes in our office and I mm -hmm. connect them to Dell monitors, like the giant 30 inch Dell monitors. Yep. And people get freaked out that they're no longer on Mac OS. And then they use it for a week and they're and like, they my machine has not crashed. I have a hundred windows open. Mm -hmm. I have a giant monitor and I don't need to reboot my computer. Yep. And it's just rock solid. What do you think is the future of Chrome OS? Do you use that yourself? Yeah. Do you think it's going to become a thing? Um, I have gone through periods of using it. I'm currently on Mac, uh, but I've spent time like maybe three or four years ago just to challenge myself. Mm. I spent a few months on just using a Chromebook. Yeah. Um, and then it was sufficient to my, for my workflows at that point, except for wasn't great at signing things. Uh, there was no way to open a PDF and insert a uh, signature, which I needed a lot of that time because we were yeah. hadn't quite implemented now those processes. Now that's super easy. But I think now, like we have web apps for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a few other things that were sort of random. I wanted yeah. a ability then at the time to like do a code editor um, and be able to have a shell. And now you can't do that on Chrome OS. Yeah. No. I mean, it has um, the whole stack now. So I actually believe that uh, outside of like hardcore finance use cases, um, we're going to see Chrome OS actually get to the point where more people are using it. Um, and I think it's sort of like a hidden uh, gem that most people don't actually pay attention to. It's, but, it's infecting schools because yeah. in a school, you log in with your Google account, whether mm -hmm. it's Google Docs or Gmail, and your entire desktop just shows up. All, yep. your, all your bookmarks, everything, your cloud, everything is just there. Then you log out if you're logged in as a guest, and it's gone. Yep. So the idea that you have a computer with a desktop and you left something on your desktop and you have to go home to get it, mm -hmm. but you got a remote into your desktop goes away yep. as a concept, which is incredible. Or if you have one computer there, so we have one computer in the house that's shared, like in the domestic office, and everybody uses it. So you go to log in, and it's got everybody's little icon on the bottom. You log in, boom, and you're up and running. Well, the other thing I think people ignore about Chrome OS and Chromebook is that they've gone through this like very complex provisioning processes for school, mm -hmm. right? If you think about it, kids yeah. lose laptops, like they get yep. damaged, all this kind of crazy stuff happens to it. Yeah. If you can handle that scenario... You can handle the enterprise scenario. And also, For sure. Chrome OS is way more secure than a lot of other systems. Right. Um, because it's all sandboxed in the browser. And so right. I actually think there's could be an incredible enterprise enterprise play there in the future. And so I, I keep watching for Google to do that. I mean, they haven't done it yet, but I and think it's And how does really Figma work in Chrome? Just perfectly, Great. flawlessly. Yeah. And that's one of the things that people say why they don't go to Chrome, where they don't give up their ridiculously priced Mac computers, mm -hmm. is because they're tied to the Adobe suite. Yep. Are you seeing people leaving the Adobe suite and moving to Figma? Yeah, we're seeing people leave lots of different platforms, whether it's Adobe or you know their competing platform of choice to adopt a cheaper computer. Uh, mm. We're seeing like our vision for Figma is to make design accessible to everybody, mm. and so that's a really key component of it is to make it so that regardless of where you're coming from, you can use Figma wherever you are. Uh, when we get back from this quick break, I want to know how you see yourself in terms of competition mm -hmm. with. Canva, oh, okay. which has infected our organization, mm -hmm. uh, probably by use of terms right now, but it really has spread like wildfire here. And then how do you compete against the Adobe suite and their new $20 a month or whatever it is to have the, the creative cloud when we get back on this week of startup? Listen, your business is going to need to pivot at times. You're going to need to be able to move quick and stay on goal and hit those targets. And sometimes it's impossible to meet those deadlines because your team's not big enough and there's too much work to be done. Well, where do you go to find that on-demand talent? How much is it going to cost? And can you be sure they're going to deliver? That's always the problem when you have to hire freelancers. Uh, well, finding the right freelancer can be 
massively time-consuming, frustrating, and expensive. That's why Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R, is a platform that helps you keep business moving with their network of trusted freelance talent. They offer hundreds of digital services, including graphic design, copywriting, web programming, film editing. You get the idea. And you can search by service, deadline, price, reviews, and more. You'll know exactly what you're going to pay up front. No negotiations are necessary. And that's really the hardest part. You find somebody, you got to negotiate with them. You know, they just take all of that out of the way at Fiverr. And they, of course, have 24 by 7 customer service, as you would expect from a professional operation. So go check out Fiverr.com. That's two R's, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, and receive 10% off your first order by using the promo code TWIST. I know that some of you don't need to save money, but please, when you go use Fiverr, use the promo code TWIST uh, so that they know that we sent you. It's really easy. You can find all the digital services you need in one place at F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Use the code TWIST. Fiverr with two R's, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Code TWIST. We use it all the time here, and we've had great results, uh, especially on SDR work and research work when we're trying to find founders and companies and people to advertise on the podcast. We do all that work through Fiverr. There's no reason for us to staff up because that's seasonal. We have an event. We need this for 60 days. Then we don't need it again for 10 months. We use Fiverr. We can burst up and down, just like using a cloud service, and pay for what you need and not more. Okay, thanks again, Fiverr. All right, Dylan Field is here. He is the CEO and co-founder of Figma, uh, which is, what is what is your one line for Figma? Yeah, uh, Figma is a way to collaboratively design applications, websites, Got anything it. you want in the browser. So when I think of Figma, um, should I be thinking of it as a competitor to the Adobe Creative Cloud or collaborative with that? Or is it a competitor to something like InVision or on the margins, Canva? Mm -hmm. Because when I started in graphic design, we were using like Illustrator and Photoshop and PageMaker and all this other stuff. And then I stopped doing it myself. I have people doing it now. But uh, once in a while, I get a link to say Envision or Figma. Who are your competitors and how do you position all of this? Because it feels like a lot of the work I used to do with designers is being done by my rank uh, and file you know, folks, a salesperson or an operator um, or somebody from operations makes something in Canva. O or I get something from an actual real designer in Envision or Figma. Wh where does, what's happening in the space and how do you make your two by two matrix, <laughs> you know, as we talk about in startups, two by two matrix X, Y, Z, like, uh -huh. you know, where it's cheap or easy to use or simple, whatever. How, how do you break down the competition here? Well, first and foremost, I'll say that I think everyone's trying to make their things cheap and easy to use right now. Cheap and easy uh, is easy. Yeah, I mean, the that's strategy. I think the goal for everyone in the space. Uh, you know, it's definitely been our intention from the start. You know, again, the vision is make design accessible to everyone. And so mm -hmm. that implies that it's simple and yeah. anyone can pick this up. Um, that said, like, first of all, just we don't see Canva as a competitor, really. Mm. Uh, there hasn't been a single deal that we've ever, like, gone up against Canva for that I know of. Uh, that's for civilians, non-designers. I mean, we have a lot of non-designers that use Figma, too. Oh, okay. Uh, designers and non-designers. I think potentially it's just different use cases that you use them Got both it. for. Okay. Um, but we do see... Everything else you mentioned. So we see Adobe all the time, uh, a variety of tools there. We see, you know, Illustrator, Photoshop, XD. Uh, we see Sketch. We see Envision um, and a lot of other tools, too. I mean, there's a sort of crazy big stack mm. people have to put together because you have like your storage tool. Maybe it's like a big cloud company. You have your asset creation tool, which is maybe like an Adobe product or Sketch. You have maybe a prototyping tool like Envision. And there's a sort of a long tail there of applications. And we're not going to do everything in prototyping, but, right. uh, you know, we partner with a lot of these, too. Got it. Uh, there's like handoff tools because you want to communicate your work to a developer. Ah. So you have like Zeppelin, you've got Avocode. Uh, there's version Explain control tools. what those tools. do. That's really interesting. A designer will go into Figma mm -hmm. uh, and make an app. Let's yep. say they make a meditation app like Calm. Yeah. Then what happens when it goes from, okay, I made it in Figma, and then there's a group of developers in Romania or mm -hmm. Brazil that I'm working with, and I outsourced it. H how does it work? that handoff. Explain it to us. Yeah. So in Figma, you just send them a link. Uh, and that's kind of the beautiful part is like, I can just send you a link to my document. You can go be inside the document as a developer and you can then like measure distances of things. You can export, you know, different areas of the, of the product that you want to be able to use in code. Hmm. Uh, you can actually export out and like read off CSS, iOS, you know, Android code as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, if another use case is kind of interesting that, 
might be useful for you, for example, yeah. is if you're on the marketing side. Yeah. Uh, all the time I hear of like CEOs or marketers that are just starting off and they are collaborating with a designer in Figma where the designer might be doing more the bulk of the design work, but the marketing person or the product person or the CEO is like changing copy uh, and they're right. actually interfacing yeah. in that way. Uh, but I've also started to hear of a lot of different companies that I've talked with where it's like a first time founder or uh, someone who's just kind of like starting off yeah. and they are actually using Figma from day one. They have no design training, uh, but they've realized that this is the way they're going to build up their app is in Figma. Mm -hmm. And they use it as sort of like for a variety of use cases, both for, you know, working through the design, but also through like as sort of like a visual whiteboard almost. Yeah. That's like infinite. let's sketch something up here. Let's yeah. try to mock something up. But, but also then, as a way to organize their ideas sometimes. Like I've, ah, I've seen um, some people that are using it in like very creative ways. Uh, I've also seen teams use it, hmm. like especially right now with all the COVID stuff going on. Right, everybody's we're starting home. To see, like, like I saw uh, earlier today, I saw um, somebody that was like organizing a bookshelf for their team virtually, where they're basically just like, we've got bookshelves around us right yeah. now. They're literally creating a bookshelf in Figma and everyone with the team was like putting in books that they liked. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, it was really cool. Or, you know, we have people that are doing like, like Pictionary games and like uh, stuff ah, like that in Figma. That's um, interesting. Yeah, just like all these sort of ways to have fun to and hang out in did, a space. Did sign up spike during this uh, crisis over it's, the last two weeks because we have to stay home? We've already had like some pretty great growth going into this and we've seen yeah. that continue. Um, so I don't but know if it it's like- It didn't increase. I don't know if there's, I haven't yet found much correlation between yeah. uh, as like Quarantine consistent. and yeah. Well, the, I mean, like there's a few deals that definitely like very, some smaller deals that mm. people are like, oh, you know, budget cycles are weird right now. We're going to put off changing. Oh, right. But then yeah, I've also too. seen on the other side of that, like some companies have been like, okay, this is the time to actually accelerate into this. Right. Like, and they're, you know, pinging their legal people being like, can you please review these documents so we can get this in right now? Ah. Because like, we can't wait any longer. We're all no longer in the office. We need to be together. Yeah, I think uh, I've seen a couple of my investments reported back to me that the number of people trialing their software mm -hmm. for subscriptions um, went two or three X. Wow. Uh, and these are like consumery kind of mm -hmm. subscription services, which is uh, amazing. And here, somebody just said they just had, this is a tweet uh, for those huh. who see it. Uh, we just uh, had the best Friday evening playing remote film <laughs> Pictionary. Yep. Uh, and this person is like coffee maker, tsunami <laughs> ruler. It's pretty hilarious. Let me ask you this. How long does it take somebody to get up and running uh, and be proficient enough in Figma to design an iPhone app? Back to that, like, I'm going to make Calm a meditation app mm -hmm. or something, or Sam Harris's waking up meditation app. How long does it take to make an app of that sophistication, which I would put at, Medium, right? It's not yeah. like it's Uber where you have a lot of crazy data sources and stuff sure. like that, but it's, you know, it's not a I one mean, function app. Yeah, uh, well, as a fan, as a fan of like that sort of app, like Column Headspace, etc. Yeah. Like, I think um, I'm just thinking about the interfaces. I mean, I think to go from zero to learning how to to replicate that in Figma, yeah, yeah. you can do that in a few hours, probably. Um, now, if you want to go to the point where you're a designer that's able to create a new experience of that quality. Yes. Well, that's that's the only years, right? Because like that's that's actually yeah. a craft. That's the craft, uh, right. The craft. So just and, duplicating you it. You know, if you can do that in years, I'll be very impressed and want to hire you. Yeah. Um, so people can get up and running in a couple of hours, yep. have some level of proficiency. As a SaaS business, right, mm -hmm. you charge per person per month. Per yep. seat? Is per that seat. Good? What does it cost per seat uh, per month? So it's different tiers. So Got it's it. free for individuals. Up to a few people. Got it. So if like you're just like watching this or listening to this and you want to try it, yeah. there's literally no downside. Got it. Uh, if you get to the point where you're at a few editors, $15. So multiplayer mode? Uh, actually, you can do multiplayer mode even when drafts. Mm. Once it gets to three people, Got then it. we charge you uh, for um, for basically a pro license. And Got so it's $15 it. a month per editor or $12 a month if you commit annually. So it's essentially free. It's, it's 150 pretty cheap. bucks a month. Yeah, like a when year, you think a year, about yes. that, 50, 150 bucks a year. If you're doing a startup company, mm -hmm. and even if you had the most modest of, uh, the most modest of funding, mm -hmm. 25k from your aunt, like you can afford. Yeah, and that's the 500 goal. bucks a year for that's, the three of you goal. to be on it, right? And then also, if, if you're an enterprise company uh, and you need more sophisticated security controls, stuff like that. Then yeah. it's forty five dollars a month per editor, so there's a little bit of a price increase there. Oh yeah, so that's but also the value that X. you're getting yeah. is also a lot more as well. Got it. And the, so that's six hundred dollars a seat per year, or something like that, five six hundred. Yeah, but, which but yeah. puts you in the 
Creative Cloud kind of versus Adobe kind of space. Uh, I mean, we're those... still significantly cheaper than Adobe. Oh yeah, what does Adobe charge for this? Uh, uh, it's like... all over the place. It depends on which pay, uh, bundle what, or twenty five bucks a month or something. I think you probably have like a, a skew have, where like... you're only a few different apps. Yeah. So there's like a there's like a bundle where it's sort of a photography bundle for like I think ten bucks or something. Yeah. But then uh, there's other sort of um, there's like an educational skew. There's like a business skew. Got it. There's like a uh, you know skew Do for you... other stuff. I heard you before talking about a little bit about like, oh, getting through legal and all this stuff. Yep. In, is SaaS at this point as a category for buyers cookie cutter enough that you can just say, yeah, go to this URL and you can buy 500 seats? Or do people who are buying hundreds of seats need to have a salesperson walk them through everything and make a specific contract for that company? This is a great question. Yeah. So, um, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Uh, Figma's oriented towards being a bottom-up model. Right. Um, and we're trying to make the business as efficient as possible. Explain that to people but, who don't know in SaaS, yeah. software as a service, basically a subscription like Netskip, like Netflix. Yep. What does bottom-up mean in this yeah. regard? Yeah, so bottom-up means that um, people in your organization are able to adopt it and they're able to spread it uh, without having to be um, to like necessarily get uh, a lot of buy-in from others around them. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you're able to do that on a credit card and people are able to be empowered to actually get their own tools, uh, hopefully they're able to first trial Figma, for example, for free, and they can go like have a purchasing conversation with somebody if they need to. Right. Um, that's like our ideal scenario is they're not even being paying for it. And they're like, this is actually really good. Like, let's go bring this into the organization. Let's have this entire team on this. And for what it's worth, we also see a lot of people spread Figma when they change jobs. Um, huh. They'll bring it with them. Yeah, so, of course. So you know, yeah. people are hopping between jobs every few years, and they're they're bringing the tools they like. But anyway, so to go back to the question about bottom up and legal and sort of what the buy decision looks like, hmm. um, we're seeing a range of behaviors right now. There's definitely a ton of companies that need to spend multiple months or whatever evaluating software, go through rigorous process, uh, especially at larger corporations. And we've got a great, amazing sales team that's like able to partner with them on that. Got it. We also see what is their main concern? Like, what are uh, they trying to uh, accomplish with all that friction? So, I mean, like, uh, security is a big one. Ah. So, uh, I want to make sure that if you are a cloud provider, that you're going to be as secure as possible. And Got so, that's it. something that, like, for example, we've gone through, like, the SOC 2 process now. Um, which is, that is? Yeah. It's basically just a process to make sure that you're able to be as secure as possible, mm. uh, even though you're hosted in the cloud. So, um, you have all of my designs. I'm, mm -hmm. I don't know, Nike or something, and I'm yeah. building a bunch a of lot apps of trust. and stuff. I have to trust that yeah. your people are not looking at my designs, exactly and right. leaking it or selling it, or yep. the Chinese government or the Saudi government hasn't put a plant into Figma like yep. they did at Twitter. The Saudis actually did mm -hmm. this. You hear that story? No, I did. Crazy. Yeah. And so, there's SOC 2, and I was simplifying before, it yeah. encompasses a wide variety of controls, everything from like hiring, offer approvals. All the way to like, how are your servers run and what are your run books for those? Oh, really? So yeah. how do you, yeah. do you worry about that? I'm curious, like this uh, international espionage that you could actually have like a, a Russian, Saudi or Chinese spy working for you at Figma? Like, um, it's not crazy at that this we point too much. Of it. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think we're pretty small scale and yeah. I think, um, but that said, we're designing the process to make sure that we are very validated yeah. uh, with every hire we make. We do yeah. background checks and everybody like making yeah. sure that um, we're able to be, feel secure about the data that we're hosting. Um, a... But uh, just to go back to oh, your yeah, earlier point, yeah, because yeah. I think it's a really good one. Yeah. Um, one thing that we're, we've are we been working towards and we're going to launch soon is the ability to also self-serve onto our highest tier, which right now you have to talk to a salesperson for. Right. And so it's just really important, I think, for a lot ah. of companies to be able to like have that self-serve motion for every tier um, because not everyone wants to talk to a salesperson. If you do, great, they're there. Oh, but if, they're, so if you don't want to talk to some brutal. salesperson, like, why do you have to? I just want to order my Tesla online. Like, to <laughs> me, the, I mean, literally, I had to buy a minivan, and my biggest fear with buying the minivan was going to a dealership. Yep. And I was like, oh, my God. So you don't God. want to be sold to. You don't want to have to, like, get the upsell, whatever. I, I, you don't want to be controlling your destiny. So. Or sit in a room. Yep. Like I'm in part of some prison experiment where they're going to leave and some other person's going to come in. You, you literally feel like you're being accused of murder <laughs> and they're like sending a good cop in, then a bad cop in. And then you're like, okay, sign these papers. And I'm like, what am I signing? Do I need a lawyer here? It just feels like horrible, yep. that experience. But I think, so you're saying the big companies will even come and self-serve to buy 500 licenses or something. Well, I, we haven't seen that yet because it's not shipped, but yeah. that's my hope is that we'll start to see more of that. How do you deal with 
uh, and we'll do this when we get back from the break, but I'm an investor in a company called Capiche.com. Okay. Have you heard of that? I have not. Okay. So what Capiche.com uh, is doing, uh, run by Austin Peter Smith, who worked for me at Inside, or with me at Inside, I should say, um, they are tackling the disparity in how much does this SaaS software cost? Mm-hmm. Because in our founder secret Slack, people, the number one sport for startups is to compare who got the cheapest price Mm -hmm. in negotiating with a SaaS company and then go and say, my friend got it for this amount. I need you to match it. Well, that's a really easy free answer for Figma. We don't do discounts. Yeah. And so here's- at at all. Here's Capiche and uh, Secret Society for SaaS Power Users. And here they are talking to each other about, Uh um, you can apply for access, but you have to go in and you have to, in order to become a member of the community, you have to give- Yep. your pricing. When we get back, let's talk about this issue. Um, and then what happens to, since you already <laughs> answered the one before the break, my teaser, I had a second one. So I'm going to burn my second teaser, uh, which is SaaS overload. Is mm-hmm. it becoming a thing where people have too many SaaS products and are going to get burned out on subscription? Subscription burnout when we get back on the Sweet Service been a little tough for startups right now. We all know that. And Zendesk is trying to be super helpful during this time. Many of us have had our minds distracted. There's a lot going on. But now more than ever, it's important to build and maintain great customer relationships. You know that in a crisis, you're going to want to work with your customers. And Zendesk is here to help with Zendesk for Startups, a great program that they run where they give qualified companies six months of free usage for their service-first CRM solutions. They also give you access to their exclusive startup community and resources to help you scale and uh, grow your customer support team. They are rolling out tons of new features like the support suite and the sales suite. Uh, You've probably heard about those. And if you're an early stage startup defined as under 50 employees, you can get started today with six free months of Zendesk at zendesk.com slash twist. It's a really amazing offer. I really appreciate them doing it. Um, if you're a startup with under 50 employees, you're probably doing pretty good, but uh, you may not have set up your customer service. You may not have set up your sales uh, and you need to do that now. And it's a great time to do it. Zendesk.com slash twist. Every customer counts when you're in a startup, especially now. So start right now building out the best experience with Zendesk. Thanks again to Zendesk for making this offer to our uh, family of startups. Great job. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Dylan Feld Field is here. Field. I'm sorry. He's a uh, Zoink, Z O I N K. You got Zoink, huh? I did got Zoink. Wow. Pow wasn't available. <laughs> I don't think so. I didn't try, Zoinks. <laughs> it's pretty great, actually. Are you are you uh, active on the Twitter? I am active on the Twitter. More active than I should be. Yeah. So you're addicted, aren't you? Uh, I. It's addicting to look at the mentions of Figma. Of course. So I look at that way too much. Do you, let me ask you this. Yeah. What's your personal stack? You wake up. Uh-huh. You take, you pick up your phone, obviously, the first thing. I try not to, but yes, a lot of times I do. Okay. So. My fiance has been trying to get me not to do that. Exactly. So now you got the phone in your hand. Uh-huh. Give me your order. Uh, Gmail, Twitter, Slack. Well, SMS, message, not in there, huh? I, yeah, I mean, probably look at it occasionally, but like I'm not in the SMS as much. So you're, you got Slack. I, I like Signal a lot. As well. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I try to default my friends to signal. I've been trying to get everyone to transition over. Why is that? Uh, it just seems more secure. More secure. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I, I started to have some friends move to signal. Mm-hmm. Um, and specifically celebrity friends. I think huh. after that, all that celebrity hacking, mm-hmm. like anybody I know who's like in the entertainment industry after the Sony hack yep. and after, you know, all those iCloud hacks were done. Yeah. They all started moving over to those kind of services. Yeah. I find myself going to SMS, iMessage, mm-hmm. and then going over to Twitter, then email and Slack. Yep. Because I like to be at my desktop when I do Slack because I it's typically requires me to have two or three windows open. Yep. And like to, my action items tend to be getting into a Google Drive or getting into a Google Sheet or, you know, firing up. I started using Notion. Have you used yeah, Notion I at all? I love Notion. You like it? Yep. It's like, I always love wikis, but mm-hmm. nobody would ever learn wiki text or wiki markup. You know wiki, like we double yeah, bracket yeah, stuff. And I always love that wiki markup language. Mm-hmm. And Notion, I, I got to touch the mouse. I yeah. see touching the mouse as like a personal sign of failure. And- uh, Well, you should talk to Notion about that. I should talk to Notion. Notion wanted to be, I'm trying to get the founder of Notion on the podcast. Yeah, and he they, says no. 
I guess he's a little shy, which is fine. But they were like, oh, we have a new product coming out for startups and we'll send you our product person. I was like, no. You're not, no, you don't get just to be on because I invited the founder. You don't just get to send your marketing person or whatever. Founders only. No VPs. So this week in startups, right? It's crazy. Like, would you want to send your like VP of product here? I mean, my VP product is like way better. I'm sure he's fantastic, but this is not the VP of product. <laughs> they're, they're way more impressive. <laughs> it's not the VP of, but he can't answer the, or she, he or she cannot answer the questions about how you started the business. We're here sure. to tell the story of the startup. Fair enough. Now, uh, I want to get into two things: the funding of the company. Yeah, but yeah. Let's put that on pause for a second. When we, before we went. Uh, to break, I had a question about SaaS overload. SaaS overload, yep. SaaS burnout. I, during this COVID crisis, mm -hmm. said, that's it. <laughs> Give me a list of every single SaaS product. Yep. Then I said, there's a website uh, called privacy.com and mm -hmm. another one where you can set, because I just saw uh, a SaaS provider just whacked us for $1,200. And I guess wow. they had increased their price and they assumed we had all these accounts. They they were doing kind of the the gnarly thing where they charge you for accounts but not usage. Yep. And that really upsets me because I like Slack's model where they're just like, this is how many people you use. So I never- Yeah, it's I very never... divisive because some people like Slack's model and some people don't. I like Slack's model too. We're not doing it for Figma because we've actually heard people that say they don't like it. Got it. Because it's, it's variable cost. Explain you don't the, know what's um, going to come. Explain the- the issue to somebody who doesn't understand what we're talking about right yeah, now. Yeah, so Slack's model is that you've got active user pricing. Um, now, the question is like, okay, is there enough trust to know that there's an active user? Um, we've definitely looked at the model for Figma, um, and it's something that I think could be really interesting. Uh, to me, it incentivizes the right behaviors. Like if you get to the point where you know anyone can become an active user and then uh, you only charge the people that are using the service actively, that seems right. like a good thing. It seems very easy to talk about, right? Uh, so in Slack's model, if you are in a Slack room mm -hmm. and you open Slack yep. and the green light goes on, you get charged that month, That's even right. if it's for 30 seconds. Yep. I wonder if there's a like a minimum threshold. Like there you have probably to be on is. For I, I don't know what it is because I've always I think like the the sort of flip side of it for us at least is yeah. that Figma. Like if you try to rip Slack out, like you'd have like people protest. You know, of course. Uh, I just can't not even. So conceivable. here, but they don't turn your account off. It's only if you use it. So for Figma, the equivalent would be. If I clicked on a link mm -hmm. and I opened Figma.com and I looked at something on Figma, well, right I'm active. now, so viewers are free in Figma. Okay. Uh, so editors are the only ones we charge for. Great. So if you so edit, edit something, something, but we're not doing that yet. Right now, it's yeah. like, right now, it's like, okay, if you're an editor, uh, you know, you can kind of restrict it before mm -hmm. your next pay period. And yeah. if you restrict it, we kind of we just assume that you're in good yeah. intention and not trying to like cheat our system. But if somebody came to you and it's like, hey, you have you build this for three editors for the last mm -hmm. six months, you would give them a credit, right? Uh, yeah, if, yeah, if, we, if, we, if we thought it was like really uh, yeah. clear that it was wrong, yeah. but um, but also you know if it's like depends on the case by case basis too. This is what you got to do is you got to build the SaaS industry now has to build trust, and yep. when they, I completely not, agree with that. They don't send a monthly notice of your bill mm -hmm. by email. They should do that. They don't send the monthly recap of who used the product. Mm -hmm. And Slack is the goal center. They send you your monthly utilization every month. Yeah, so I love that about Slack is the trust part. Yeah, um, I think it's it's hard to get all of the different parts of this right for definitely mm. for sure Yeah, to figure out, okay, what are all the controls of like when somebody is a full user of the product? Right. Because in a sort of hybrid world, what does that mean? Right. Um, maybe this in Slack example, it's like single channel guest versus multi-channel guest versus yes. a full user, et cetera. Um, every, every SaaS product seems to have some version of this. Right. Um, I think another example- For you, it's that, editors versus viewers. Yeah, it's, it's a simple version, but there's other also like, okay, what if you have someone that's just like on one project in the team? There's other variants as well. Yeah. Um, and then there's, I think, in addition to it, I think it's there's a lot of different touch points that a company, like people forget how large Slack is now. Yeah. Uh, and so making sure that you're able to really have a team that's dedicated to like increasing trust. Mm. Like I would give us like a, like a B minus C plus right now on this. Yeah. And that's, I'm a harsh grader for sure. But yeah. I definitely think there's things we can still do because we are doing them to make sure that we increase trust for our customers and transparency. Yeah. And like, obviously that's what we want, especially in a time like this, yeah. where we've got uh, people that It's are, such a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah, especially when there's a downturn, people are really looking at costs. Yep. I think it's super important that you know exactly what your bill is gonna be, um, mm -hmm. and that if there's not like some prizes there. And so we're really yeah. trying to make sure that we're clear about that. What was the name, Nick, uh, producer Nick of uh, uh, Broder's company? I forgot the name. 
Do Not Pay. So there's mm-hmm. donotpay.com. Oh, Josh is awesome. Josh is awesome. Yes. He's a big uh, Twitter guy. Yeah, he's great. Um, well, and then he's great as good as a human in person, too. Oh, is he? You know yeah. him? Yeah. Oh, you're friendly? We're, we're both Teal Fellows. You're both Teal Fellows? Yeah. So no wow. Teal Fellows. There we go. And now we opened it up. How okay. does one yes. become a Teal Fellow? Uh, well, take us into that. You young. apply? Yes, you got to be I, young. I, I applied when I was 20. Okay. I'm 28 now. Um, How did you become of the Teal Fellowship uh-huh. and Peter Teal at the age of 20? Um. Well, I literally just applied. So, I mean, I was a second class of Teal Fellows. But how did you find out that that even existed oh, in see. the world? I yeah. think TechCrunch, honestly. Like sort of um, like TechCrunch or something. Yeah. Uh, and then I, that was the first time I saw it. And then a guy um, from the Teal Fellowship, that was one of the fellows from the first class, reached out to me through a mutual friend. Uh, we grabbed coffee for like literally five minutes and because he, he was late. And then yeah. he's like, you got to be a Teal Fellow. I'll text you about it later. What Bye. does it mean to be a Teal Fellow? What, um, do you, what happens? You get $100,000 over two years to start a company. Um, and it's non-dilutive. There's no equity investment. In so p- it's a gift from Peter Thiel. Yeah, basically uh, from the Thiel Foundation. Got it. So he gives you, and then how many are there? And is there some twenty secret, per year? Twenty per year. And then uh, in addition to just like the money, what I think is actually more valuable is there's right. a community behind it. Got it. Uh, so people like spend time together. And um, they take how many pints of blood a quarter? <laughs> Zero for me so Zero far. Pints of blood. I, I can't talk about the people in the new cohort. You can't I don't know. T- the new cohort. Uh, thinking, <laughs> no, that was the joke of uh, yeah, yeah, Silicon Valley. I know which joke it is, yes. Now, what would you say they're selecting on? What are they oh, optimizing man, for? Question. I think when they honest, pick them. I honestly think it changes every year. Okay. Um, and why you did know, they pick you? Do you think? What did they tell you? Uh, You're so think- iconoclastic. <laughs> Are you a, are you like a an alt writer? Are no, you an independent thinker? Do you, do you a contrarian? I, I try to be meta contrarian actually. Right? And the, well, they actually had a an essay question on. Um, and by the way, the alt right didn't even exist when I. That's applied. true. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's predated. The uh, uh, but when the they basically had the famous Peter Thiel question of like, what's one thing you believe about the world to be true that others don't believe or something? What did you write? I thought I'd be meta contrarian, so I wrote an essay about how I don't like chocolate. You were you don't like chocolate. I don't like chocolate. Oh my! So I wrote Just a full on. I know. This sorry. Is bullshit. It's now. Great to, Honestly, great to see you. <laughs> it was great to meet you. But so you said you don't We've like chocolate. I uh, did. I pass on investing a figure. No, no. But we met um, oh, in O'Reilly when I was uh, in high school. Wait, wait. We met when? Uh, food camp. We met at food yeah. camp when you were in high school, mm-hmm. when we were all up there playing werewolf. Yeah. Oh my God! I'm I have, remembering I, you were like I, a high school kid. Yeah, I have a Mahalo mug. Or rather, that my mother is, has Mahalo mug. That is hilarious. <laughs> Thank you for my PTSD. Mahalo Sorry. was like my failed startup <laughs> that got to 10, we were at $10 million a year Wow! in run rate before Google just said, Mahalo, eHow, how stuff works. Yeah, that was a big change. Uh, answers.com, you all are too, ranking too high and off. And wow. they took 80, 90% of our traffic overnight then they took the answers from our websites and put them in the one box five years later. And now when you go to Google and you type in how many people died of coronavirus, they put the number up top. Yep. That was literally the idea for Mahalo. I'm sorry to trigger this. And I look back on it and I just think, wow, they what a sinister group of people. Matt Cutts and these guys lied and said we were web spam. Mm-hmm. When we did everything according to the books, we we would index pages only when they hit 400 yep. words or more because they were like, oh, there's too many stubs in there. Like people are coming to landing pages that aren't filled out, like a short Wikipedia page. So we're like, fine. I told Matt, we'll just no index anything under 400 mm-hmm. words, everything above 400 words, then we'll index it. We'll just write the software to do that. Yep. And he lied to my face. And they literally, if there's somebody who wants to do an antitrust, just go back in time to them pushing Yelp down, putting eHow, Mahalo, everybody else out of business. Uh, or moving them down the page and ankling them oh. and then replacing them with the one box. And the sinister thing is they use their technology to find the answer on your page and then put an abstract on the top. And if you opted out of that, they wouldn't index you. So Man. they gave you no choice. It was like one of the most sinister moves in the history of, it taught me a lot about business, which is you know, when you're up against one of these big companies they will lie to your face and it doesn't matter who you knew i knew surrogate i know larry i knew marissa i knew everybody at the company and i called them all and i was like i have to lay off a hundred writers who are working from home for 15 dollars an hour because you just took 80 percent of our revenue away and we've been partners for years what are you guys doing 
And they were like, yeah, we don't know who's in charge. I'm like, well, can you get somebody on the phone? Like, well, Matt cuts. And Matt's like, yeah, you know, uh, we got reports of web spam. I'm like, which page? What? Yeah. Oh, so uh, somebody asked, what is Foo Camp? Uh, O'Reilly had friends of O'Reilly. Tim O'Reilly would run this camp. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of nerds would go there and they would have an unconference where you just put on the whiteboard what you were going to talk about. Wow, you were just a kid back then. How old were you at that time? Uh, 16, 17? Uh, yeah, something like that. How did you wind up at Foo Camp at that I, age? I grew up in Sonoma County, and oh. my friend's dad was the IT guy for O'Reilly. Is it the IT guy for O'Reilly wow. still? Yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. So cool. So Teal gives you 100K. Yep. And is that what really made you an entrepreneur? Uh, did that send you on your mission? So, I mean, I was definitely like already interested in tech yeah. from O'Reilly days right. uh, and getting to interface with people like you and yeah. uh, other entrepreneurs. Um, the uh, I put 25K into the seed round, right? Jeez, for, how, did for, for, no, oh, how did I miss Sorry. How did I miss it? But, uh, but no, oh. so I, I got to work at um, uh, a few different places. I worked at LinkedIn in the early days oh, um, wow. in summer of 20, uh, summer 2010. So I guess like not super early, but Amazing. it was like a few hundred people, 400 people Look at that point. you, hustler. Um, worked at Flipboard the summer after that. Right. Uh, that was an awesome experience too. Um, went back to school for a semester. Went back to Flipboard for Where six months. Where did you go to school? I was at Brown. Oh wow, very cool. Making uh, your own degree, and then you just <laughs> no, I was doing computer science, math. Yeah, but um, uh, but I had some friends that did that, and yeah. um, then I uh, went to Flipboard, back to Flipboard because I wanted to do more design work and product work. Uh -huh. I was doing CS and math in school, but wasn't sure like that's what I wanted to do long term to be an engineer. Um, yeah, I was okay at it, but I also saw that a lot of people were like way better than I was, and also mm -hmm. like I just was really interested in product and design. And Flipboard was willing to like give me a design internship when I really had not much experience in design at that point. That's amazing. Um, and so took him up on that. And then while I was there, started talking with my now co-founder, um, then TA, yeah, uh, a guy named Evan Wallace, who had been doing a lot of WebGL experiments. And we were tired of talking about like, you know, would we ever start a company? He was the one person I would like think of as a co-founder because yeah. he was brilliant and humble and kind, just like an amazing person. Uh, thought, okay, let's let's go figure out if this is something we want to do. Right. And the Teal Fellowship I applied to it kind of on a whim because I thought, okay, if we end up going down this path, like there's the 1% chance that we do this. But like in the world we do, like we probably want some cash yeah. to go like pay for bills and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, I applied. Uh, we originally applied, I think, with an idea around drones because uh, like it's 2012, 2011, yeah. sorry, 2011 at the time. Yeah, And just like big. the two different tech technologies without were cool were like drones and WebGL. Yeah. Um, and so... The drone idea was pretty terrible. And then like, I think within a few weeks after I applied with that, I said, okay, actually, we're not going to do that. And Evan and I have been talking about like, okay, the only way you can really do a drone business is, it seems like surveillance is probably the only thing. Yeah, and it so, seems like, like that's it's a not, big one. We're not interested in that. I, I don't understand why we haven't gotten drones for non-lethal uh, police work yet. I know that we really don't like the idea of robots um, doing police work. But when you think about... Um, Mentally ill patients, uh, we called them uh, emotionally disturbed patients, EDPs, mm. I think is the term on the ambulance. They would say, hey, listen, you got an EDP. Be, be aware, you want to wait for the police because this could be a volatile situation. Why we don't have non-lethal drones that can just fly above somebody and drop a net, I know it seems cruel, but it's mm. a lot less cruel than somebody getting shot. You well, know, the, like The things that I'm more interested in drones doing right now, sorry, this is a bit tangent. But, no, let's uh, do it. But, Tangents are great. Um, uh, there's like my friend Star is working on a company I believe, uh, working on like, how do you actually do drone deliveries of like critical medical supplies? Yeah. That I think is like extremely yeah, cool. We had somebody on the podcast who was doing the one with the fixed wing drones that mm -hmm. can be launched from these little like, s almost like rubber band spring things and then be landed and you kind of hook them. So, yep. and they're so cheap th the, and they can go so far as opposed to battery operated quadcopters or whatever, but these VTOLs are coming and we're actually going to have the Chinese VTOL company that's already putting humans in these. Wow. Uh, quadcopters on the podcast later this That's year. Awesome. All right, when we get back from this break, I want to talk about how you funded the company because you recently got Sequoia to do the mm -hmm. Series C after they turned you down for the B. I yep. want to know how you got the number one venture capital firm in the history of Silicon Valley to say yes after they said no when we get back on This Week in Startups. Silicon Valley Bank is built to help move bold ideas forward and faster. For more than 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has helped startups go from the seed stage to Series A and beyond. With that kind of experience, they know how fast the world of innovation can change. That's why they offer services that can expand with you at your pace, which is probably a fast pace if you're listening to this podcast. That means insights, expert advice, and scalable solutions for each stage of the startup journey. They anticipate your needs before you actually do. 
Maybe this is why 69% of U.S. venture-backed companies with an IPO in 2019 chose to work with Silicon Valley Bank. So here is your call to action. If you're a founder, potential founder, or just somebody with an idea and a whole lot of ambition, Silicon Valley Bank has solutions that will help support you from the seed stage all the way up to the big stage. Visit svb.com forward slash twist, T-W-I-S-T. That's right, Silicon Valley Bank. Ideas, bank here. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Dylan Field is here triggering my PTSD from Malo.com days. Sorry for that. Uh, it's okay. Uh, you know, what's interesting about that business. We we did a bunch of YouTube videos and they yeah, still I make- I think it might be how I got the mug. It's probably how you get the yeah. mug. We, we're still making a ton of money every month, like maybe huh. 10 or 15 grand just from the YouTube videos being up there because wow. they're so well indexed. Um, and we have one site called XFIT, X-F-I-T. YouTube.com says XFIT. We have 3 million subscribers. Wow. And we haven't posted new videos in five years. And I'm trying to find somebody to buy it or, or partner with me on it. So if you're into fitness and you want to do this, let's go. Um, what was interesting about that is, you know, I talked to Sergey Brin about this is back in the day when he was still super involved. And he's like, well, what would you do better or different? And I mm -hmm. said to him, like, if you're going to make changes, a way to be a better partner uh, is to simply make beta.google.com, have an mm. ombudsman, as opposed to Matt Cutts kind of lying to us in our faces. I know you like Matt. So I like Matt, I, yeah. Matt's very. I know Matt's widely liked, but he lied to my face. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to never stop saying that because it cost a bunch of people their jobs. He did apologize to me later. He wrote me an apology letter um, and said they didn't handle it the way he thought they should have. And he was sorry uh, for what I went through. But I mean, that still cost 100 people their jobs because he lied to my face about us having like being spammers. But, you know, I, I said just if somebody were to use your platform and do something like tag spamming, you know, when like on Instagram, they put like 50 hashtags and they have nothing to do with what you're following. Yep. Uh, and they're just doing it to get caught up in search. If somebody did that on your site, in the beta dot Google, it would say it would flag them and let you see it, yeah. And say these are the things that have been removed, and here's your site, and here are the things we're concerned about, and communicate yeah. that to I, people. I think so. I think, and they don't I, communicate that. Well, so just uh, to kind of like level up a bit for the topic, I think yeah. there's actually some just a gem here uh, for all companies. Yeah, and it's something I'm thinking a lot about is in terms of design. Yeah. So for Figma, one thing we do in our product process is try to just like get features out in front of the community as fast as we can. Not mm -hmm. only not to just ship them, but also just to get the feedback on them. Right. But the people can the get upset that, if you change stuff. Well, it's less about managing people being upset and more about getting to the point where you're building the best product. Yes. Um, and I think that the thing that's going to be really interesting here, so one thing we're trying to do with Figma is talk more and create more of a movement around what we're calling open design. Hmm. And What is open design? So basically open design is like a few different things. One is how do I become in my organization, how do I design do design more openly? Hmm. Uh, but also in the context of the world, how do I have a design process that my users, my customers can actually be part of? Right. Um, but doesn't how do I be more transparent? Isn't the downside to that being transparent that you're educating your competitors? Uh, it depends, right? Like another way to think about it is like you're actually becoming more anti-fragile. You're creating a community that's uh, more loyal to you. Right. Um, and you're working with them and partnering with them for the long term hmm. to make the product that's best for them. Explain so, to people what anti-fragile means. It's, it's kind uh, of like, yeah. I actually don't know if I have like a good one line definition to you. Um, well, it's Talib's idea that there yeah. are certain, uh, there's, uh, there are systems mm -hmm. that do better in times of crises or with volatility. Yep. So if something is volatile, like the moment now, what does better in volatility? Mm -hmm. So are there cities in the world or people who think and who are designed for a volatile situation? So instead of being fragile, they're the opposite of fragile, which is not being necessarily strong. It's being resilient and strong in the face of a chaotic situation, yep. right? That's a great definition, yeah. I think that's the way he defines, I try, I've always tried to, I, and you know what, I, I in his, when I, I've, I've listened to that book twice, mm -hmm. and every time I listen to it, I get more from it. I kind of feel like his books, I think you kind of get them on the third reading. Huh, uh, so okay, I'll have to read it a few more times then. Yeah, same with Black Swan. I mean, I think if you are living through what we're living through right now, yep. the Black Swan is something you really need to understand, which is, just out of left field, your whole world can get turned upside down. Yep. How how have you handled this at Figma? You have over a hundred employees. Mm -hmm. You were a work in the office mostly company. Yeah, we're for... we're 160 people. Yeah, uh, we have maybe you know we have three people in Amsterdam. We have 10 people ish that are remote, maybe a bit more. Uh, now, of course, we're all remote. Yeah, um, I think there's a few things that we've done to handle it. So first and foremost. Um, you know, as soon as we started seeing the graphs go up for San Francisco, mm. um, just like a few cases, we knew what yeah. that meant. And we just said, everybody goes work from home now. Did you do that? And before? So, were you able to 
Did you do that when they did the quarantine, before or after? No, it was much before. Really? Um, before it? Wow. Yeah. So it was, I mean, it's like one of those things where if we're being overcautious here, yeah. this is completely okay. Yeah. And better to be overcautious and figure out how to do this. Isn't it amazing how quickly it flipped? It was like yeah. we were talking on Monday or Tuesday yep. in our company about hosting our accelerator. And it was like, yeah, it's under 50 people. They said keep things under 50 people. Mm -hmm. The Warriors game is still happening. Then I think it was that Wednesday night which was, I think, the day before we were going to have the accelerator. Yep. I'm sitting there at home, and they canceled the Warriors, the, not the Warriors game, they canceled a game mm -hmm. at tip-off because they got somebody's test results while the game was about to begin, and they just told everybody to go home. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, but it's the right move, right? It and was so the right move, of course. I think the yeah. other things we've done at Figma, um, first of all, just like over-communicating every chance we get. Sure. Um, what are you saying obvious. as the leader? Uh, I mean, well, for us, we're thankful that so far our business hasn't been impacted. So. Yeah. You know, we've had a few deals, like I said, have slowed down. A few sure. deals have sped up. Um, but overall net, it seems like things are growing roughly the same past. Nice before. thing about having a subscription business. Yeah, I think in terms of anti-fragile, yeah. probably subscription businesses for remote products mm -hmm. would be the anti-fragile in this market. Yeah. Um, that's, what we're, that's what we think yeah. we're seeing. We'll, we'll know more soon. Yeah. Uh, but I think, and also I'll say this too, I think yeah. that um, you know, in the next few quarters, everyone's impacted. Sure, because you know if you're if people are companies are laying off people, yeah, et cetera, uh, which is the likely chance of what we'll see. Yeah, um, I think everyone's impacted, even companies that thrive in a remote situation. If I half said, of like, your companies, yeah, if half of your companies lay off ten or twenty percent of their employees, they're yep. certainly going to uh, reduce the number of seats. Of course, yeah, and then people who are not using the product might be looking at their monthly credit card bills and changing it. That's mm -hmm. what I went through with, and I was doing with this Do Not Pay and Privacy.com. We're looking at yep. those solutions right now. And both personally and at our companies, we're putting each, we're doing burner cards for each SaaS product with the amount we're currently paying. Yep. So if they try to do a dollar more, the card times out. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this also for pl horrible customer support places like the New York huh. Times and the Wall Street Journal, where they make you call them on the phone to cancel and then harangue you for canceling. The Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal is the worst. And the Wall Street Journal has all this weird, confusing pricing where you pay 30 bucks a month and then they pop it up to like 20 bucks a week huh. or something. And all of a sudden you get this huge bill. And so I'm going through every single thing. I'm gonna, and I'm, I think they these companies charge 10, 20 bucks a month to have this service. Wow. And I think that's gonna become the gold standard is you yep. just have a credit card for each of your SaaS providers, which means the SaaS providers need to behave back to our mm -hmm. second or third segment. They here. need to be ethical, transparent. Ethical, transparent, sending the bills, and then yep. you don't surprise people and they won't use these tools, but this is the inoculation that people are using. Yep. Versus, do you think people, now that you're a work from home company, mm -hmm. and you obviously did not, you were not all in for work from home. You believe in people being in the office yeah, and collaborating. I, mean, I, th I think it's great for people to be in physical spaces together. Yeah, so you you were not bought into this like other people are. Do you bought think- into the, oh, Let me define that more. Yeah. So I think bought into the possibility of it, but still think there's great benefits to being in an office. So how and does so that change when this crisis ends mm -hmm. in I think April 15th? Oh man, I think that'd be awesome if it's true. I think- uh, well, Apple's be, opening awesome. their stores in the first two weeks of the, uh -huh. the the rumor, and I don't know if it's been confirmed yet, but I heard some inside information. They're going to open Apple stores in the in the first two weeks. Yep. And I think restaurants are going to start opening again April 15th or so yep. in that time frame. And then I think Trump said something like, we'll be back for Easter. So I think people are going to get the test results back. We were sitting here on the 24th. I think people, last week was peak fear. Mm, in my I, mind. It could be this week for people, but I was I experiencing I, peak I, fear I, last week. I, I, I don't want to do be think? a downer here. Okay, uh, go ahead. But should I be? <laughs> yeah, do okay. it. I mean, nobody, I mean, I, I think, Dylan, nobody knows. I mean, that's I, one yeah, thing we've learned I, I here think is that, nobody knows. I think that we're going to see, I hope that for California and yeah. for other places that have put more restrictive measures in place earlier, yeah. that we'll see, um, you know, sort of like the stabilization, uh, the fact that you're talking about yeah. and hospitals won't be overloaded. I don't think that means that we can all just go back to work and go back to the way we were living before huh. uh, because I think we'll see a second wave effect right. where there still is the virus out there and we'll start to see it spread again um, yeah. and then hospitals will be overloaded then. So I think the... Um, uh, so know, what do you think? You think San Francisco, there's a chance San Francisco, Bay Area, San Mateo County, et cetera, says two more weeks of this, four more weeks of this? I, I think it could be a lot longer potentially and I think there could to be... All the way to May or June? I don't know. I'm wow. not sure, but it's. Um, I think that there's also potential for if we start to see people disregarding the orders, I wouldn't be surprised if we see enforcement. Yeah, and that's something I that's think, like I think people aren't even thinking about right now. 
Yeah, but it's a uh, that would, would be, be civil unrest on a level that would be disturbing. I don't know. Would it? It yeah. depends on sort of like how people think about the situation. But yeah. in any case, going back to yeah. sort of our comms, I mean, I think uh, given that we've been very fortunate to be in a situation where uh, you know we're we're doing well as a business, just mm. trying to focus people on yeah. okay, look, we're safe right now, but we also understand that you know it doesn't matter if we're safe or not. Like your productivity is going to be related to the outside events right now, right. and there's so much anxiety going on that like. If you take a day off, if you if you're a parent and you've yeah. got kids at home, like we know your productivity is going to plummet. That's like, what I tell are, people. I was like, listen, just here's take- credits for urban sitters. Here's oh, like ways nice. to yeah. uh, offset that. We had a thousand dollar bonus for everybody in the company um, or oh, stipend you- rather. Just like you can use it to improve your work from home situation, oh, or you can nice. use it for other things if like that's what more is needed because these are yeah. times that the problem with childcare is you, you shouldn't be bringing another child. We were thinking about getting extra childcare at our house, and we're like, we don't want to introduce another person. We're thinking about uh-huh. getting a tutor, and. I think a lot of parents are going through this, which is, okay, a tutor sounds like a great idea, except what if that tutor was out at a spin class last week or at a bar yeah. and, or they just flow some, flew somewhere and they're non-symptomatic, asymptomatic, and mm-hmm. they're going to all of a sudden infect everybody. You can't bring a tutor in. I think we're going to get so much testing online yep. in the next 10 days. Because we did, I think, 50,000 tests yesterday or the day before, and that was on top of like 150. So we increased a third and I think we're still doing 50,000 tests a day. I think we might get to 100,000 tests a day. If we do that, we've blown away all testing in any country. Mm-hmm. Now imagine we have a million people tested in the major cities, et cetera. We're going to look at this and go, okay, here are the people who've been tested, have it, and are no longer, you know, who are uh, now, what do they call them? Like the herd immun- uh, immunity or whatever. Uh-huh. We're going to start knowing who has it. People are going to, the fear is going to go down. I believe that we're not going to have, with the exception of New York, I don't think we're going to have overloading in the ICUs. Uh, yeah, I hope that's right. That sounds and great. then people are going to go, I'm going to go back to work if we have enough distance between our desks, mm-hmm. if people are wearing masks, and here's the kicker, I think we're going to get into a uh, show me your papers. Hmm. And it's going to be, did you take a test? And what were the results? And you have to be tested every 15 days. Yeah. The- if everybody gets tested every 15 days, we're going to have a really good handle on where the pockets are. And imagine you got on the subway and had to show your papers and got uh, your test, which is uh, the uh, yeah, forehead temperature. I, th- the, I think the, the question is like how much tests, how many tests are there? And also- Unlimited uh, when they go to these new ones, right? The IgG tests, whatever yeah, they're calling them. I, I'm not sure. The regions I heard were limited. So that's why yeah. I'm asking about they're, it. But. They're limited now, but the amount coming online yep. and the profit of motive to do like at home tests and all mm-hmm. this stuff has kicked in now. And so I think it's just going to be unlimited testing hmm. between 15 and 30 days. Anybody who wants a test, you want to- you, yeah, You'll have 10 be, tests I, I sure hope that's right. Desk. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's absolutely going to happen. And uh, the inside information I heard is that- the ICUs uh, in California and in Washington, they're starting to now uh, empty uh, and they're not filling. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, so, I, I've also, I mean, like my- New York's a problem. One of my ex-coworkers, his wife is working yeah. in an ICU right now and- Where? As of, in, in, in King County. Um, and- uh, Where's that? It's near Seattle. In Seattle. Uh, near Seattle. And, near Seattle. Um, uh, they don't have masks, like they're huh. overflow- the hospitals are overflowing. So it's, really? I think there's a lot of different information out there. And so Interesting. it's- The number I of tests we'll, went down dramatically yeah. in Washington. They're, they're, they're not giving, they only give tests to people who need them. Because of the supply, yeah. Uh, no, no. They, yeah, because of the supply, they only give them to people who have symptoms mm-hmm. and they don't have any more people with symptoms. So the number of people being tested has just plummeted down yep. to like 20% or something. So they're definitely on the downside of the yep. slope, but you're, you're correct that it could kick back up. Yeah, so we'll see. It's really, this is such a crazy time. Do you it think? I'm, I'm really, again, feel very thankful that like things are going well, but also like yeah, my imagine. heart goes out to all the companies that are oh. struggling right now. And it's uh, a lot of friends that are, you know, both in tech, but also outside of tech that are, are having a really tough time. And so it's, um, anyway. It's I was just, talk. Uh, I was playing cards last night with my LA poker group. Uh, my friend, a lot of people are po- popping up like poker games mm-hmm. and then putting on Zoom to do something at midnight yeah. with their friends. And uh, one of them's in the restaurant business and he was like, Hakkasan, you know, the great uh, Chinese food restaurant and clubs um, laid off 16 or furloughed 1,600 yeah. people. And uh, David Chang laid off everybody or furloughed everybody. Everybody's laying off everybody. Yeah. It's bonkers. It's really uh, the restaurant business and that stuff. They He told me in LA that 80, he, this is what he believed, 80% of restaurants in Los Angeles mm-hmm. will shut down. Yep. I was like, how is that possible? Why don't they just not pay their rent? He said, the landlords have been looking for reasons to kick out the old tenants. Wow. 
who have sweetheart deals and they might be able to sell their buildings. So they are going to take this as an opportunity to foreclose on those restaurants. Yeah, but there's also like the second and third order effects, right? Yes. So it's like, okay, well, for real estate, actually, how many, what, what will supply shock do? And then also from there, uh, will people actually be willing to go out and see these places right now in the first place? Yeah. Um, or for construction, like, can you actually create new buildings when there's not like the workers to do that? Um, yeah. Uh, or if people continue to have like pretty uh, hardcore shelter in place restrictions. So I think yeah. we're just the start and it'll be fascinating, but also really scary to see what happens next. Yeah. I'm an optimist. I, I think. know me too, but I, yeah. I think it might be a different time scale. The so other we'll thing see. I'm hearing about is that this chloroquine, the z pack azanthromycin, is that the guy you pronounce it? And then zinc, this mm -hmm. treatment, there's been some scattered reports that people are giving this treatment when they first have symptoms mm. and seeing a 100% recovery rate. Now, wow. these are anecdotal on small samples, but I think that's the other thing that happens. And one of the reasons why we are having a hard time judging, the, da the data coming out of China is probably very hard to understand because mm -hmm. they have incentives and the Chinese government isn't always 100% transparent. Um, laughing for reasons should be obvious to everybody. Uh, also, newsflash, North Korea may not be giving out correct information. Kim Jong-un maybe didn't hit three holes in one on his first round of golf, uh, as they famously printed. Um, and Italy, um, you know, might not be the right test case to apply everywhere else because of their older population, the fact that they didn't have a quarantine and they're smoking, and there's a lot of personal contact. Those are all the theories I'm hearing from medical mm -hmm. experts of why it went supernova there. So it may not go supernova here. And so then as time goes on, you start to get the treatments, and you know how to treat. And then people now, because they're aware of it, are going to the hospital quicker, whereas in Italy and China, they might have just said, you know what, I don't need to go to the hospital. I'm fine. I just got a little sore throat. I've had this before. It's no big deal. And then all of a sudden, they have lung failure. And you know, people might yep. be going quicker to get tested. So... It's really interesting. Uh, a note from uh, one of our people, San Francisco. This is just unsubstantiated, uh, but San Francisco hospitals, extra tents are over, are full of homeless. Mm. Older at risk nurses sent home, uh, according to uh, one of our people's neighbors. Um, that's actually another thing is this homeless situation here. Can you imagine how that's spreading yeah, through the populations in L.A.? and? I mean, that's just crazy. Let's go to funding. Um, okay. uh, I know it's a hard turn here, but we have to keep moving forward. I think it's very important that the economy keep moving forward because the second and third order effects here. Yep. If if people like you or I, you know, other investors, other founders just decide, you know what, this is too hard. Forget mm -hmm. it. I'm not going to hire people. I'm just going to manage my business, not for growth. Yeah, well, the money is still there and looking for return. So I think right. that the venture markets, I mean, they'll they'll change. Right. Uh, but I think it's, it's not like nothing's going to get funded because especially with interest rates dropping even further. Like there's just nowhere else to put money in. The stock market's not the place I'm right saying, now. Why so. don't I have a mortgage? Like I'm like, wait a second. If it's, I don't understand if the if it's the Fed is zero, not quite zero, but it's close. Right. Why are the mortgages still at three and a half or something? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't those get much D closer? Different rates, yeah. They should get much lower. If they well, said they we're going to do more, all mortgages for the next year are going to be one percent. Mm -hmm. Man, you'd see a lot of activity. People would start mortgaging their houses uh -huh. and spending that money. I would. Yeah. yeah. Why don't they do that? I mean, I don't know. Well, it's a question for the banks, not for the Fed. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when you, you uh, Danny Reimer at Index did your mm -hmm. seed. Yep. Uh, you had Greylock, congratulations, do your Series A. Yeah. Uh, Kleiner Perkins, Mamoon, um, formerly of Social Capital, did the B. Mm -hmm. But Sequoia passed on the B, you said. Yeah, well, actually, Greylock passed on the seed, too. So wow. we, we have a history of, uh, of firms that passed us then All right. back so in the later. All right, so you got passed, and they said, hey, listen- what was the reason? Let's go through this. What was the objection that Greylock gave you when they passed on the seed? And yep. then how does one as a founder take that no mm -hmm. and turn it to a yes 24 months later Yep. or 36 months yeah. later? Yeah. So basically the person I talked with at Greylock was John Lilly, who going back to our earlier yeah, conversation was yeah. the CEO of Mozilla um, uh, for a long time. And so I like, deep respect for him. Very technical, uh, loves design, kind of like the perfect person to join us and- um, uh, stock with a bunch of firms for the seed. One of them was uh, Index, and they mm. called us that night and were like, we're in. Cool. That's awesome. Amazing. Um, was that like a quick 500 or million dollar check or something? Uh, well, we raised, they did 2 million of a $4 million round. Okay, wow. Uh, so it was, it was awesome. And they were, they've been incredible partners the entire way through. I mean, like they've been awesome. Um, but another firm we talked with uh, was Greylock and John Lilly in particular. And uh, John, John was like very transparent. I mean, he's like a very direct guy. Mm. And uh, he's like, look, like, 
and and to be clear, he was correct. Uh, and he says it with a lot of compassion, but he was like, I really like you guys. I like what you're doing. I think there could be something here, but like, I don't think you know what you're doing yet. <laughs> you're not qualified. And, and and to be fair, like we totally didn't. Agreed. Um, and not just from like a like business standpoint, which I mean, we're all learning all the time, but also from like a strategic standpoint. Yeah. Like we just didn't have the right strategy at that point. And so then kind of went to the point of like, okay, let's we'll just keep talking. And he made it clear that he was down to. And mm. so we kept having coffees every month or two. Wow. Um, and he would give us advice and just was, and he'd give us connections. He introduced us to people that were really helpful. That's amazing. Uh, and then so how from, I can be helpful is kind of the way people make fun of VCs. Uh-huh. But, but what you're like saying, mean it. in John Lilly's case of Greylock, yeah. he actually did that. He yeah. didn't have skin in the game. And he was just helpful. And he was, he was just, like, just helpful. Genuinely awesome and helpful. So people hate venture capitalists in Silicon Valley because they think that how can I be helpful is like uh, pandering nonsense or whatever. Mm -hmm. When in fact, it is your firsthand experience. I mean, I think most investors I've met in Silicon Valley, and this is a biased experience for sure, and I'm yeah. not saying everyone shares this, but uh, have genuinely be helpful. And like, yeah. also they, I think like the investor sort of personality type often yeah. is definitely one that's much more nurturing and like yeah. wants people to succeed. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of like, you don't, I don't think make, make it long as an investor if you don't have that personality no, type. No, you have to be of service. Um, yeah, and it's if like, you if you're not of service you're and you're like the aggressive like Shark Tank person or whatever, like that's not the thing that actually happens. No, Shark, this is why, um, like, when they, wh I, I got pitched on Shark Tank when it was Dragon's Den, and they were just mm -hmm. bringing it here, and when they pitched me on it, and I, I was potentially going to be on it in that first season, I mean, I, I did two calls with them, and then I didn't wind up on it, um, which made sense, because I didn't have any successful investments at the time, and I, I said to him, I said, you realize that this, like, negotiation, because I watched the Dragon's Den stuff, I was like, that's not actually how it happens, like, you're not trying to diminish the person and make them feel bad yep. so you can get a better deal. You're kind of doing the opposite. You're trying yep. to build them up knowing they're going to storm the beach and the likelihood is failure and they're going to get their head blown off and this company's going to zero. So you're kind of sending them off to this crazy war knowing, so you want to get them pumped up to storm the beach. Well, there's, there's also an incentive for investors of like, you don't know when the next company is like, right, the next amazing company next to Uber or whatever is right in yeah. front of you. And so- you don't want to piss someone off. Bad for uh, that, like, Yeah, exactly. I want the chance to like lead the next round or whatever. Yeah, um, if you were a jerk to Travis during Scour or Red Swoosh, mm -hmm. you may have missed Uber. Yeah. Uh, or if you were a jerk to Elon at X or Zip2, maybe you don't get Tesla and SpaceX yep. or Boring Company. But I've also like just had very few experiences where investors are jerk. Like most of them have been awesome to me. Yeah. Um, but going back to John, and he was yeah. at some point after a lot of coffees, he said, look, like, if you ever think about raising a Series A, and this is when we're still in stealth mode, by the way. Like, wow. We hadn't yet launched anything, had no customers, but we had started like a very small alpha. Hmm. And he's like, if you guys um, think about raising an A, let me know. And a few weeks later, I called him up and was like, hey, like, think about raising an A, really want to work with you. We did talk with a few other firms, but yeah. like, it was, I basically just wanted to work with John. And if even if the other firms had said yes, yeah. I don't know if I would have gone with them. It's a good lesson for investors, you know, like be of service, be as helpful as you can. And as Naval told me when we were both starting mm -hmm. off maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago, maybe 10 or 11 years ago, we both started to do angel investing. Um, and he said, Jason, the reason we're winning is because we're in a competition to see who can be the most helpful. And the mm -hmm. three most helpful people right now, three or four most helpful people are Paul Graham, you, me, and uh, Ron Conway. Huh. And we're the ones who go talk to founders mm -hmm. and write small checks. That's the race to be the most helpful. And I'm going to start this angel list thing. I'm taking my, my venture hacks blog and I'm going to make it a website yep. like Facebook or LinkedIn for angel investing. And I was like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Crazy times. Uh, so Sequoia yep. passed on the B. Yeah. So we talked with uh, Mamoon, for example, for the B and ended up doing yep. it. He's an awesome. It was Moon's actually his first, his first check in uh, KP. Oh, was really? Um, so I was really wow. stoked about that. And um, and KP has been, I was a KP fellow as well. I was a Flipboard. They've oh, been wow. like, you know, amazing influence for a long time. Um, and uh, and then we talked to Sequoia as well for the B. And uh, Sequoia was like, look, like we just can't reconcile the position in the space right now. Like, oh, you know, to my question earlier, like, is this Canva or Adobe or Envision? What is this? Yeah, like like there's so much going on. We don't really get a the lot space. Of noise, like, yeah. there's a lot. Of, you know, it's let's we're gonna have to wait this one out because mm. we want to invest in the right company here. Right. But 
we because don't they have will enough only information. make one bet. Exactly. They're not going to bet on your competitor. Right. And so they're like, we want to wait it out and make sure that we have total confidence and we're ready to pay a higher price for that. Wow. So come back to us next round when you've proven that out and uh, we'll pay up. Yeah. And I did. I came back to them next round. I was like, okay, like, you sure you want to pay up? And they're like, yep. Wow. So Fantastic. That, it happened quite quickly. And we also already had that relationship and we had been building that relationship with them as well. Because I think the other thing people like, I think a lot of times people, when they fundraise, they think, oh, this is kind of like this transactional thing. Yeah. And my experience has been that you don't want it to be that. Like Danny actually was somebody that um, I met at Flipboard uh, when he was a board member there. I mean, just like very briefly, but still like I knew of him. I had done references on him. Like nah, it wasn't like I just like, like showed up and was like, here, this is BC guy. Should like yeah. go raise from him? Uh, all the investors we've ever had, I've tried to build relationships with before you put someone on your board, it's like, that's so necessary. Hmm. Like, uh, that's like a, it's like marriage. You're not going to like jump into no, marriage with somebody you... in Vegas that you have met a day before. Yeah, You're going to no. like get to know them over time. And so it always like blows my mind when entrepreneurs just like go in and raise from someone after they've known them for like a day. It's so uh, weird. I mean, it's one thing when you do it in the for, party round. Like, exactly. Or and like for, for a board seat. Each, a board seat. Yeah, for a board seat. It's like, you're going to get ready. Yeah. Because this person person's personality is going to come out and- Totally. And you want to you know what you're going to get. Oh God, I've had these board experiences where like, there's got to be like, it's always like every 10th board or something, there's somebody on the board who just feels like this is their chance to show how smart they are huh. and how much experience they have. And yeah, they well, dominate the conversation and the founder can't speak. I'm like, when I'm on board calls, I'm quiet. I'm just, I mean, it's really unnerving for people <laughs> considering I talk for a living, but I'm super quiet. And I just, I write my questions down. Yep. And today I was on a board call. I just, I had four questions. I wrote them in as few words as possible. And I numbered them one, two, three, four. And I said, my questions are, we got, you know, to minute yeah. 75, which is why I had to push the podcast back 50 minutes. And I was like, well, I, put, I have my four questions. They're in here. Uh, you can answer them now. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can answer some of them now. And if some of these require a little bit of research, uh, I, you can just tell me by email or text me yeah. later. Uh, but well, the other thing we do is for board meetings, now we're on a different tangent, but the- No, uh, tangents are great. Uh, okay, great. Point, point of the sure. show. Um, so we, uh, well, often for board meetings, like we always have the metrics. They come out every month uh, to board investors. Yeah. And that way it's like, if you have a question with the metrics, we expect that to be like before a board meeting. Like yeah. the board meeting is for strategic stuff. Yes. We're going to send up, I send out a letter beforehand and right. I do a deck as well. Yes. And so it's like, here's a very focused strategic like conversation. Right. And then also the other thing we do uh, is I then take the deck and I show it to the entire company afterwards. Ah, um, I used to do and, that too. Yeah. And it's just like awesome because that way it's like we have transparency across like well, up yeah, and down. Everybody gets scared. Oh, the board meeting's happening. Yeah. Oh, he's getting ready for the board meeting. Uh -huh. And it's like, oh, it's just like, it's like, no, it's like let's like be clear about what we're talking about and you, what that means you for you. You as the employee know more than what's going on in the board meeting, mm -hmm. by the way. As a team member, you're in the Slack all day. You have the back channel. Yep. You, you almost universally have more. The only thing you probably don't have is the funding plans or M&A or whatever things can't be public. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I just realized when we were talking about what's going to change after this uh, corona crisis that we're going through is I'm noticing, and I, I, this is going to be a very interesting s second half of the year, where people who worked from home for the first time mm -hmm. learn how to do it, and then bosses who are learning how to do it now uh, and I'm among them. I mean, I have one company inside, which is the former Mahalo, um, mm -hmm. which is 100% remote. And then I have Launch, which is zero. Well, no, there's three remote people, actually. I take it back. Uh, like, support people are mm -hmm. remote because you can't get them in San Francisco anymore. Um, you find out who actually is making an impact because I just told everybody, tell me at the beginning of the day what you're working on. At the end of the day, tell me what you got done. Mm -hmm. Just way I just have broad strokes, sort of like the stand-up, I guess. And boy, is it revealing who's getting shit done and who is not. Yeah. And you start looking at these lists. And now what I've started to do is I tell people when you, if somebody leaves the company, pull out their end of the day, end of the week reports. I'll consolidate them all into one. And then let's look at what they're doing and then ask ourselves of these bullet points of what they got done in the last three weeks, which one of them could have been outsources or automated. Hmm. And I think we're going to see a wave of um, downsizing because mm -hmm. people realize they have gotten fat. And they may have mm -hmm. people who are not actually contributing. Then you're going to see a wave of promotions of people who are actually getting tons of shit done. Yep. Well, I think there's different companies, right? So it's yeah. like for companies that have been performance managing this entire time and making yeah. sure that they're like hiring correctly and then, you know, working through if someone's not a performer. How do you make sure you know if someone's a performer? How do you do it? Um, Figma. Well, How do you know people are not like just coming to work and looking busy? 
I think it depends on the function, of course. Sure. Uh, but you know, I like think scales it's... has a scorecard, so we can leave them out. <laughs> like either they sell a, sales has a scorecard, yeah. so you can leave them out. Right? Well, like, sure, but it's sales is not just about the scorecard, right? So it's like yeah. if I'm a salesperson and I tell you, oh yeah, like you should sign because we got these three features coming. Yeah. And those three features aren't coming. Yeah, of course. Like, you got to look at the that, churn. Then, then yeah. you're out. Yeah. Like, yeah, Holistically, you got to that, look at it. That's not something that we tolerate. If it yeah, goes, lying, for not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think there's stuff like that. Uh, there's obviously like the basics, like values, integrity. Mm. Um, but also like for us, the values are, you know, um, like uh, it's a different conversation. I'll go into it later if you yeah. want. But um, uh, so I think there's like the culture, sort of like the two by two for this one is actually kind of interesting. You know, it's, uh, you know, if you have someone that's like very like high culturally, they're a great culture fit and they're a great performer. Um, wow. Then like amazing, perfect. you got the perfect employee. Yes. If they're like a low culture fit, you know, low performer, awesome, like very obvious. That should not, they should Cut. not be your company. Yeah. Bottom the left harder origin. ones are like people that are like the people that everyone likes, but they're not quite, you know, performing at the level that you want them to. Okay. Or they're- um, Top left. Top, or, or that's top actually the one right. that's probably the harder one is the one high that's- High performer, bad high culture. High performer, bad culture fit. That's the ones you have to like actually uh, work through very quickly to figure out, okay, why is this not working out? You know what I say? And then get them out of the door. Cut. I. I think it's a simplistic answer, yes, but Cut. I think the compassionate one is that you have to actually work with people on this stuff. And so yeah. that's more the culture that we have at Figma is more around like, how do you actually give feedback? Do you find you can actually give people feedback where yes. bad culture fits and get them there? Um, Out of 10 times, how often does it work? Well, I think we've done a pretty good job of screen for culture fits. So it's rarely okay. like, but let's say you make the mistake or the yeah. person, people can snow you during the I interview think process. What's more likely is if you give people feedback mm. and they don't like the feedback because uh, they're not a good culture fit, right? then they leave on their own. Ah, so that's what we've seen probably more often. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. So what I learned now is it's very hard for an employer to change the fundamental nature of the employee. Uh -huh. um, so if they do not get it, if they're disruptive at work in a bad way, like they're disruptive in a good way, like, hey, we got to focus on this. It's This is broken. That's good. And yeah. yeah, here's my ideas to fix it. But if they're just like, this place sucks, it's never going to work. Why are we even trying? Mm -hmm. Like that person... You just, I, I deal with this all the time with young founders. They're just like, yeah, no, I'm working with them. I'm like, newsflash, it's never going to work. I yeah. just ask people, are you a psychologist? Well, we are don't... you a therapist? It's not going to work. Like, yeah. why are you wasting your time? Like, We don't really have anyone like that at Figma, so I'm, right. I'm thankful for that. Um, you must have had that experience, though, where you did a bad hire and tried to work with them, even, and it didn't work. Even for hires that haven't worked out culturally, like, I don't yeah. think we've had that level oh. of, of bad hire. Yeah, um, I see people get so desperate at the early stage. I think you've probably been more considered, but people get very desperate at the early stage because they need this specific thing uh, done. Yeah, that's a And it's a trap. blocker. Yep. And they, they get somebody and they're just like, yeah. this, this person can unblock this for us. They've sold before. They've been a great VP of sales. Then they get them and like, oh my God, this is a mercenary marauding person who is just going to stab you in the back the first chance they get uh, and demand gotta, more money. And You have to be really careful about hiring. Yeah. And it's- um, Oof, Hire slow. I, 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 it's so hard to actually do it though. And it's like, I mean, we, we just Hiring? Closed. Well, no, hire slow. Hire slow like is it's, hard. It's very hard to actually Why? follow that advice. Um, Why is it hard? I, I agree with you 100%, yeah. to be clear. Yeah. And we have followed that advice, but it's, um, I'll give Why you an example. Why is it so hard to hire slow? I'll give you an example. Yeah. So like um, one of the top constraints in our business is hiring right now, right. Uh, just to get it very meta about the conversation. And yeah. uh, we've had a head talent search that we've been doing for, I think, seven, eight months now. Just closed it. Super stoked. Took us seven or eight months to close it though. To and find that time, a head of talent. To yeah, hire the people exactly. you need. Exactly. Right, that is many. And, yeah. but, uh, but we waited to find the right person. We knew exactly mm -hmm. what we were looking for, made a list. Yeah. And we knew there's a few people out there like that. And then we went and relentlessly looked for that person. Yeah. Meantime, my HR leader, uh, who's amazing, and the reason why we've got a lot of great ways to get people feedback at Figma, right. um, she was you know managing recruiting and uh, putting like so many hours in on mm -hmm. top of being a working mother who, yeah. uh, and then you know coronavirus hits and her kids are oh, home. Boy, and it's yeah. like, She's got a lot going on yeah. and she was putting her all in every day. And I'm like, oh gosh, I hope you don't get burnt out. Like, yeah. uh, but in the meantime, she was also on board for like, okay, we have to make the right hire here. And, you know, everyone take on the time. table was like, let's take our time. Here's the difference. You know, when you get more seasoned, you realize if it takes six or seven months, that's shorter mm -hmm. than hiring somebody in three months, working with them for six to 12 months. And then starting the entire six month process over again. Yep. Because that's two fucking years. I'm yep. sorry. That's two years of your life. The wrong hire. Yep. Uh, so you might as well take the extra couple of months. And I'm constantly telling people like, they're like, so what's your, you know, the, I don't know who taught this to like the Harvard MBAs or something. Somebody gave this to like the smart kids in the class. So what's your timeline for hiring? And is there anything 
that uh, would stop you from hiring me or that would be a, a red flag for me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd love that advice. And you're just like, I always tell people, when we have the absolute right person who's a culture fit and who has the skills and is motivated, that's yep. when we're going to hire. But we're in no rush because we're overstaffed and we want to wait for the right person. And mm -hmm. I always just now, I have the luxury of this now, but I always try to overstaff a little bit mm -hmm. because if you have 30% more capacity in a business unit, they can be more creative. There's less burnout. P the culture goes up. Yep. So sometimes the inefficiency, as a you know, in terms of yeah, I mean, it sounds staffing, sounds awesome. I've never gotten to the point where I feel like we were overstepped yet. But well, um, I mean, think about it this way: you ha do you have a personal assistant? I do. Yeah. Um, now imagine or an EA for the business. An EA per, business. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So P A E A. Um, now imagine you hired somebody for the weekend mm -hmm. for five hours every Saturday, five hours Sunday at remote, just in a Slack room, who is doing support for you. Mm -hmm. And now think about that extra capacity and the cost. Maybe the person costs 25, 35 an hour, work from home, mm -hmm. remote support for you. It's an extra 10 hours. It's an extra 300 a week. Can you imagine how much more productive you would be mm. if you had that? I set that up. I was like, you know what? I want to have Saturday and Sunday coverage, just 10 hours. So if I need to get stuff done on the weekends, I can be productive on the weekends and have that resource. And they can do stuff that... We know that Monday need to be that needs to be done by Monday mm -hmm. because we're going to all get back in the office and we want to hit the ground running. Let's clean up the stuff that we need to get done over the weekend and we give them work on Friday mm -hmm. so that Monday we hit the ground running. And that's just an example of a little extra capacity. It's like, is this perfectly efficient? No, but it's extra capacity. It's like having those extra cans of soup if in case a coronavirus breaks out or gasoline in your generator or whatever mm -hmm. and you're keeping your gas tank full. A little extra, especially when you've raised a lot of money, not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Not a bad idea. If you can find the right people. If you have the right people, their culture fits because yep. they also then it gives a little bit of that sort of Google 20% of like, well, maybe the people actually have a little bit of cognitive yeah, time no, left over. So we were always in the studio here worried about our archive, like all the NASs and, you know, we produce th hundreds of hours of footage, actually yep. thousands of hours of footage a year because we use multiple cameras. And I was, you know, now we have two directors here, Charles and Nick. We used to have one. And it's like, we could get by with one. But by having two... I hear they don't burn out. I think I hear him. No, you could. You could do it with one. Yeah. I mean, um, it would just be, we would never get to those projects. We yep. would never catch up. So we probably have 50, we probably have a third extra capacity. And you know what? Then I don't have people quitting and f being burnt out. Yeah, for sure. And uh, if they take a vacation, the place does not fall exactly. apart. So I just like a little extra capacity. All yeah. right, listen, this has been great. Thanks for coming in and doing yeah, the Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Six feet away from me. <laughs> um, Dylan uh, Field, you can follow him at Zoink, Z O I N K. And you can talk to him. He likes to talk about politics and the coronavirus. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Probably wants to talk to you about design. And yeah, Figma. Figma. Uh, F-I-G-M-A dot com. Go ahead and get a free account. Start using it and uh, make your dreams come true. You know all the people who use it. My team over at Uber. I don't know anybody at Uber anymore. Uh, Airbnb, right? Google, Microsoft, Dropbox. Mm -hmm. Everybody uses it? Uh, not everybody yet, but we're working on it. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, thank you, man. All right. Uh, we'll see. Uh, stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. <laughs>